I am going to talk about neuromuscular control of a joint. An outline of my talk is given here. I will first talk about how we externally assess movement, uh, how it is done clinically and then from that we will have an understanding of how we use data in assessing uh, a joint in the musculoskeletal system and then I will talk about the physiology of uh, skeletal muscle contraction. I will talk a little bit about mechanics of force generation. I think in other lectures uh, in this course you have already covered uh, mus skeletal muscle contraction and maybe a little bit of mechanics of force generation. Uh, but I hope I will deal with it slightly differently from the way it is done uh, usually. Uh, after talking about skeletal muscle contraction, I will talk about the uh, reflex control of a single skeletal muscle and then we will put this together and uh, articulate a single joint which consists of two muscles and then I will use computational models in discussing all of these so that we have, uh, we have a chance to see whether what we have discussed uh, uh, qualitatively can also be simulated quantitatively. If you are able to simulate it quantitatively, then we have uh, some uh, reassurance that our theory works uh, in, in principle. And finally, I will talk about some applications of muscle movement models uh, because this is a question that uh, physicians and uh, physiologists always ask us, what is the point of doing this uh, quantitative models? So first, how does uh, a physician examine uh, somebody who has weak muscles or a, uh, a pathology of the neuromuscular system. The cl uh, clinician typically supports one limb of the joint, uh, one segment of a limb uh, and then across the joint the other segment is, uh, is perturbed by the uh, physician or the examiner. And what the examiner is actually doing is assessing the stiffness of the joint. The stiffness of the joint uh, can be very low if the muscles themselves are weak. It can be very high if the muscles are active uh, and if the muscles are involuntarily active, however much the physician or the examiner asks the subject to relax, the subject will not be able to relax and that is an assessment of spasticity. When we talk about uh, a single joint, we have a muscle pair and uh, the muscle pair is part of a physiological system where we have reflex control which is a feedback control system as well as uh, voluntary input to this muscle reflex. And the feedback control system uses length and force sensors uh, to control length and to control force. And the spinal cord estimates the error between the desired signal or the desired position, desired length of the muscle, desired uh, angle of the joint uh, and it also estimates the error in the, uh, uh, between the desired force because if you are uh, lifting up a paper cup of coffee let us say, you do not want to hold it as tightly as you would hold a cricket ball. And therefore, there you are controlling force, you are also controlling position. And both these error signals are uh, computed in the spinal cord and then uh, the uh, spinal cord has what is called the alpha motor neuron which is what controls the muscle and this alpha motor neuron is the error correction controller. And therefore, by, the, by this means of this feedback control system, we uh, can control both uh, joint position and we can jo uh, control the joint torque. Uh, at the background of the need for two muscles to control a joint is the fact that muscles can only contract, muscles cannot expand. That means muscles can only produce tensile force and they cannot produce compressive force. That means if you pull a muscle, uh, it can present a resistance, it can present a resistance depending on uh, the activity of the muscle. But if you compress a, a muscle, whether it is active or not, it will simply collapse and therefore the muscle cannot resist compressive force, it can resist tensile force. That means muscles act only in one direction. Uh, even if you stick out your tongue, it looks like your muscle can expand but it cannot. Uh, when you stick out your tongue, you have a set of muscles that only contract, that means only uh, reduce in length. But this uh, uh, extension of your tongue outside your mouth for example, is achieved by a set of contractions uh, of muscles that make the tongue uh, assume a certain shape and other muscles that pull part of the tongue outside the uh, the mouth. So, there also you only have contraction, you only have tension, you do not have uh, any compressive force, you do not have any expansion of the muscles. And uh, therefore, because we have only muscles uh, being capable of moving in one direction, that means only shortening, only producing tension, we need to have at least two muscles if I may, if I am to be able to move a joint in both directions. That means, if I should be able to move my joint in the uh, 
clockwise direction to you and in the anticlockwise uh, direction to you, I need to have at least two muscles, one of which will produce the flexion or the re reduction in the angle of my joint and another muscle, a different muscle has to do the extension or the increase in the angle of my joint. And this is a complementary or opposite directions uh, of action. There are uh, many engineering systems also that employ uh, uh, such mechanisms and uh, if you want you can draw parallels between uh, complementary action in a muscle and complementary uh, action in uh, certain kinds of amplifiers in electronics for example and so on. So in the muscle pair I have uh, used the term flexor to uh, denote the muscle that re uh, reduces the joint angle and extensor to denote the muscle that uh, increases the joint angle. So in the case of the elbow I, I will find it convenient to use the elbow as an example because I can uh, show my elbow very easily. But the same thing uh, is true of almost all the other joints uh, 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 that you might encounter. So the other joints are typically your wrist joint uh, here also you have flexion, extension, re reducing the angle between my hand and my forearm or increasing the angle between my hand and my forearm. But in the case of the wrist, it is you also have another degree of freedom that means I can also adduct and abduct. And in the case of the shoulder, I leave it to your imagination. In the case of the knee, we have again a fairly simple action and in the case of the ankle also, we have a, uh, a fairly simple action in that it can flex and extend but the ankle can also rotate in and out. And therefore, these other joints have multiple degrees of freedom like the ankle joint, the wrist joint and the hip joint the shoulder joint and in those cases we have more than one pair of muscles but for every kind of action whether it is flexion, extension, adduction, abduction uh, and so on there you need a pair of uh, muscles because each muscle as I will keep on repeating can only contract. So how do muscles contract? Uh, first of all just a little bit of uh, uh, revision of uh, facts that you already know. Muscle contraction is initiated by a nerve signal and uh, you can say ultimately the nerve signals will arise from the desire of the organism or the desire of the human being to move the hand in a certain way. Uh, and then the desire is converted into a signal that goes to the spinal cord uh, and from the spinal cord another nerve signal goes to the muscle. So muscle contraction is initiated by nerve signals and then you have a connection between a nerve that is the motor nerve that controls the muscle and the muscle itself and that is called the neuromuscular junction. Again this is only review for you I am sure and after the neuromuscular junction is traversed you have an electrical signal on the muscle, fi muscle fibers themselves and after this electrical signal goes on to the muscle fibers you have what is called the excitation contraction coupling where the electrical signal is converted into a change in the chemical en environment of the muscle cell itself. So this change in the chemical environment is the release of calcium from stores in the muscle fiber itself. These stores uh, as you will know are called uh, the sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum and when the uh, uh, storage of calcium is released it, uh, it floods the environment of the muscle fibers and this presence of higher concentration of uh, calcium in the, uh, in the inside of the muscle cell uh, results in the ability of two other large molecules inside the muscle. Uh, I should say two other sets of large molecules in the muscle called the myosin and the actin. So this conversion of uh, electrical signal to this release of uh, calcium is called the excitation contraction coupling. Excitation is used to refer to the electrical signals in the muscle and, con and the contraction is the uh, uh, molecular uh, activity within the muscle. And uh, the interaction between the myosin and the actin molecules is what causes muscle contraction. Now, uh, so what is this interaction? When, uh, when people initially uh, examined uh, muscles molecularly, they found what appeared to be a large molecule and they simply called it actomyosin. And later on they found that this uh, large molecule called actomyosin that they called actomyosin at that time, we do not use the term anymore, that they called actomyosin at that time was, uh, was there only when there was calcium and they had uh, essentially in retrospect you can say they had forgotten to take out calcium in the solution where they were examining. Uh, these molecules. If you do not have calcium then these molecules seem to be separate and then you call them actin and myosin molecules. Now when there is a chemical reaction between these actin and myosin molecules and they attach to form what appears to be a new protein molecule uh, which earlier people uh, were calling actomyosin then this new pro uh, long or a large protein molecule has a different shape 
than the actin and the myosin separately. So imagine that you have a piece of rubber band and it uh, has a certain length. If you twist the rubber band, it takes a, a slightly shorter length and if you pull it apart, it presents a, a resistance to that pulling apart. So this is roughly what how you should picture it. I, I think you should think of all these large molecules that have some elastic properties as, uh, as some kinds of uh, rubber bands uh, uh, representing these large molecules. So they can take on different shapes. They can take on a twisted shape where they are bent and they can take, in, uh, take on a different shape where they are elongated and uh, not twisted. So this twisting or this bending of this molecule is what produces force and uh, this is, uh, uh, is at an extremely small microscopic level. But the accumulation or the pulling together of all of these, uh, you know, you literally, uh, uh, you know, if you imagine people who built these large uh, monuments uh, thousands of years ago, you can picture or at least you would have seen pictures in documentaries and history books of thousands of people carrying this large block of stone. That is uh, how you, you uh, convert the force between two little molecules of actin and myosin that are some few tens of thousands of Daltons in size and producing perhaps some femto newtons of force into a large force that can move uh, your hands uh, and ultimately in collections, uh, in other collections move large pieces of stone simply by actions of these molecules. So here I have summarized what I have said so far. So here I have uh, uh, a block showing the motor neuron activity that is the signals from the nerves and then the neuromuscular junction which I have also uh, talked about. And after the neuromuscular act, uh, junction, you have electrical activity in the muscle fibers themselves and that is the muscle fiber action potential and then I have mentioned the excitation contraction coupling where the electrical activity is converted into a change in the chemical environment and that is simply a change in the concentration of the uh, calcium in the muscle, inside the muscle fiber itself. So there is this little compartment inside the muscle fiber called this uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when there is no excitation, the sarcoplasmic reticulum utilizes some energy to drag back all the calcium against its uh, concentration gradient and store it. So that is an energy using activity. And when you have this electrical signal on the muscle fiber, the sarcoplasmic reticulum has various uh, channels which open up and quickly release the calcium into the environment. So the environment is what contains, the environment inside the cell is what contains the actin and uh, myosin uh, uh, molecules and then in the presence of this calcium, this actin and myosin as I said attach to each other and change shape. Uh, if you look at some physiology books, they will refer to this change in shape as a conformational change. So this change in shape is what produces this tiny amount of tension which then is multiplied simply by numbers and that is our molecular force generation. So here I have condensed the interaction between the actin and myosin by this simple expression. Actin and myosin and I put a subscript 90 to say that the myosin has a segment called the myosin head which contains uh, uh, principally what is called the heavy uh, meromyosin. I will simply refer to it as the myosin head. It contains the myosin head which is the major component that changes shape during activity and that when it is uh, in the separate form, this actin is not attached to myosin, it is in this form where the maxin, uh, myosin head is at an angle of 90 degrees. So that is why I use this uh, uh, subscript 90. As soon as they attach, they attach in the presence of calcium and as soon as they attach, the immediately afterwards you can say at uh, T0 plus, the myosin is still at uh, an angle of uh, 90 degrees. But immediately it goes to a state where it changes angle to this 45 degrees. So this is also referred to as a power stroke. Imagine that uh, I have uh, the stable and imagine that my hand is the myosin uh, molecule and the myosin head is my uh, fist. I grab the stable and I change uh, the angle of my elbow. As soon as I do this, the myosin, now remember this is the myosin. The myosin is changing shape from 90 degrees to 45 degrees. Then I am pulling myself along the table. I will use another analogy to describe this. Now once it is in this uh, state of 45 degrees, then in the presence of ATP, that is the energy utilizing uh, stage of muscle contraction. In the presence of ATP, this, can, this bond can be broken. This uh, connection between the actin and myosin can again be broken and this cycle can repeat. So if there is ATP, the 
uh, the bond between actin and myosin will break and uh, the muscles re relax again. If there is calcium, the cycle can restart uh, as you might know uh, because this is the stage that means the breaking of the connection between actin and myosin is what requires energy when muscles die they go into what is called rigor mortis that is the rigidity after death. Uh, it is Latin uh, in science we tend to use a, la a lot of Latin words but it is e easier to simply transcribe it into English and say it goes into a rigidity after death. So, here I will describe a phenomenon of muscle uh, which again you might uh, relate to experientially. Uh, the a basic property of muscle is the ability to produce force depends on the length of the muscle itself. So, first let me describe it and then I will go to the graphs. If you want to uh, let us say uh, pull something towards you uh, very strongly, let us say you want to lift something and produce a maximum uh, amount of force. What is the angle at which you will keep your elbow? Approximately 90 degrees because if you try to lift something at this angle for a long time you, are, you will find that you tire easily and that is because the capacity of a muscle to produce a lot of force at a longer uh, length of muscle is less than at an intermediate length. And similarly, will you carry a, an object like this and walk? No, it is unlikely again because the capacity of a muscle to produce a lot of force at a short length is less than its capacity at an intermediate length. So, that is what is described by this curve. So, this is length and this is the force. Now, uh, remember the muscle if it is not at all active that means there is no uh, nerve signal to it, it acts like any other polymer, it, you know, uh, it has many uh, large molecules inside the muscle. So, if you, were, if you were pull it, it will act like a rubber band and uh, it resists this pulling producing a, a tensile force or a tensile opposition to this pulling and therefore, when the muscle is passive we have this curve and this is the passive muscle force and follows the an approximate uh, relationship similar to any other uh, large polymer molecule which is an exponential curve. But when you activate a muscle and do the same stretching of the muscle then you find that this curve is what is produced. This is the active muscle which includes the activity due to the actin and myosin uh, combining together and the, uh, the passive force which it anyway possesses, uh, possesses inherently. The difference between the active force and the passive force is this, this curve. So, you subtract the second curve from the first curve, you get the third curve which is this hill like uh, or hillock like uh, shape and that is the so called inferred active force that is what the muscle is producing actively. It is not measured, what is measured are only the first two uh, curves. You can uh, measure it when the muscle is completely inactive, you can measure it when the muscle is completely active and the difference between those two is what is uh, uh, being produced actively by the muscle. And the same uh, hillock like curve is redrawn here and I am showing the, uh, three different segments of that curve, uh, a descending slope that is A, a plateau that is B in the middle and an ascending slope that is C. So, we have A, B and C. Now, if you look at it and uh, you combine it with some uh, uh, visual or visible data that people had about uh, 80, 90 years ago, then you will be able to uh, put together the evidence and, uh, and see that you have these long uh, filaments that are called the thick filaments and thin uh, filaments called the thin filaments. The thick filaments are actually made up of myosin molecules and the thin filaments are made up of uh, actin molecules. And therefore, this interaction between the actin and myosin are possible only when you have the actin and myosin facing each other or close enough to each other. They should be close enough to within a, a fraction of a micrometer uh, to each other for them to be able to attach to each other. If they are far away obviously, they will not be able to attach to each other unless you provide some force to bring them close together. And therefore, uh, Huxley came up, uh, uh, Huxley, uh, A. F. Huxley who won the Nobel Prize for a lot of his work on muscle and also for his work on nerves came up with this explanation saying that you have interaction between these thick filaments that is the myosin this uh, filament made up of myosin molecules and the thin filament which is made up of actin molecules. And at very large lengths the amount of overlap between the thick filaments uh, and the thin filaments is small and therefore, the ability to produce force is decreasing as you go to larger and larger lengths. 
and at very short lengths also I uh, will explain this a little bit more uh, little later what happens is the ability to for them to again produce force it decreases okay. and uh, so there the explanation that Huxley gave uh, uh, qualitatively is to say that opposite sides of the actin filament seem to interfere with each other and therefore they uh, result in this decreasing force producing uh, uh, capability which is segment C of the uh, of this curve of the active force producing curve and B is the plateau where you have uh, almost all the myosin molecules being able to pair with an uh, actin molecule to produce uh, this compound molecule which people call actomyosin. So to describe that I will give you what I call uh, the millipede model of uh, molecular muscle contraction. I gave you this example of my hand holding the table and changing angle and pulling uh, uh, my body uh, in a certain direction with respect to the table. Now imagine a millipede and I think a millipede is actually a very good model of uh, the thick filament because like the thick filament you have uh, the millipede having a lot of legs and the thick filament has a lot of myosin heads. It is made up of many myosin molecules and all these myosin molecules stick out from the body uh, or the backbone of the uh, thick filament and they stick out and like the assembly of the uh, uh, thick filament all the heads in a in one half of the thick filament are facing in the same direction and as you know uh, millipedes can only move forward they cannot move backwards if you I mean they can curl up and so on but that is not relevant to us but they can only move forward why do they move forward because their legs have a certain pattern of action they uh, can grab on to a surface and uh, draw back when they are drawn back they cannot push back they will lift their leg again place it in front uh, attach and draw back. So that is a very good analogy for the so called power stroke and release stroke of the myosin head that is attaching uh, onto the actin. So now imagine that I have a single millipede it is uh, walking in this direction as I have uh, uh, shown an eye to give you an idea of the direction. So now the millipede walks only in this direction. If I hold the millipede and consider the movement of the stick if the millipede is uh, trying to walk on the stick the stick will walk move in this direction right that is very simple for you to visualize. Now if I have two millipedes and they are facing in opposite direction uh, as is the case in the uh, of the thick filaments then and let us say they are attached to each other by some little piece of thread uh, and each millipede has its own stick and each millipede has its legs that are now cycling. Now how much force do you think uh, will be there on the sticks that are pulled by this millipede and also by the stick that is pulled by this millipede and what is the direction in which the sticks will move. Now obviously this uh, millipede is trying to move in this direction and this millipede is trying to move in this direction and therefore this stick is being pulled in this direction and this stick is being pulled in this direction. So this is what produces a net tensile force it is being pulled to make the uh, distance between these two opposing uh, sticks uh, less it is bringing those sticks together. Now you can have many such uh, pairs of millipedes attached to the sticks like this and they are all pulling together and you will then have this very small displacement of sticks that is on the order of a few micrometers that because of addition of these uh, uh, pairs of millipedes and sticks will add up and will give you a large uh, translation. So each pair of millipede is what corresponds to a sarcomere in a muscle fiber. Now we will uh, uh, extend this <coughs> analogy and use it to understand uh, uh, the quantity of, mus uh, of force produced by muscle. So I will uh, just reiterate the millipede is the chain of myosin molecules or the thick filament and the stick is the uh, fibrous actin molecule or the thin filament and the millipede legs grip the stick pull and move pull and move and the energy used for releasing it is ATP. So the, the some amount of energy is required for the millipede to release the stick. Uh, so the energy utilization between milli, uh, millipedes and uh, myosin and actin is not uh, uh, a very good analogy so I will not go into the energy utilization but for the force production the analogy is actually very good. So how much force do you think will be there now imagine picture yourself playing with a millipede and a stick 
how much force do you think you will uh, face if you try to pull the stick away from the millipede. It depends on how many of the millipede's legs are able to attach to the stick, right? And it also depends on the mechanical advantage that each leg has in terms of its ability to pull. So, I have now put in some uh, algebra in here. So, this is our basic uh, simplified uh, reaction that says you have actin and myosin which has a uh, initial angle of 90 degrees. So, think of this uh, as a millipede's leg uh, in its extended uh, uh, state. So, this is the extended state of the leg and this is the contracted state that is the 45 degrees and the 90 degrees is the uh, contracted and extended state. Now, as I just uh, asked you the force that the millipede uh, uh, presents to the stick depends on the number of attached, um, attached legs and that corresponds to the number of attached my, uh, myosin and uh, actin sorry this is sorry for the spelling error actin links. They are also called cross bridges in the uh, in the literature. Now, uh, I will explain this uh, algebraic expression. Uh, if the total number of uh, potential actin and myosin attachments is uh, let us say 100 percent and at any given point in time let us say a certain uh, a fraction which I call n of the, uh, t is attached uh, a certain fraction of uh, potential uh, attachments uh, is available at any given point in time. Now, the rate of change of the number of attached myosin and actin depends on the new actin and myosin attachments that can be formed as well as the number of actin myosin attachments that can break off. So, here I in this equation I have a rate constant f for formation of the attachments that means actin and myosin being separate becomes actin and myosin being attached. f is the rate constant of attachment and g is the rate constant of detachment. So, the f and g are put into our equation this is like any first order chemical equation. So, n is the number of uh, uh, attached cross bridge sorry the n is a fraction of attached cross bridges uh, and n varies as a function of both uh, position of the each leg and the time ok. Uh, remember x refers to the position of each leg and 1 minus n as a function of x of t is the number of detached cross bridges. So, the, uh, the change per unit time depends on the detached cross bridges that can attach with the rate constant of f and you from that you subtract the number of attached cross bridges that can detach with the rate constant of g. So, this is a very simple equation that tells you the number of new cross bridges that are being formed at any given point in time. We take the partial derivative uh, of n with respect to time because at this point we do not want to bring in uh, x as a variable to simplify solving the equation and that is also to uh, use experimental data where x is uh, varied at a uh, at a constant rate. So, uh, if x is varied at a constant rate we have a constant velocity of change of uh, muscle length or uh, change of the distance uh, between the millipede and the stick or the change in distance between the uh, thick filament and the thin filament. If we have a constant velocity then the equation becomes simpler to solve and therefore, we take the partial derivative and this is the equation. So, here also I could have written uh, n as a function of x of uh, x comma t, but we are going to solve it only in a, as a function of time. And once we solve it and we calculate uh, the number of or fraction of uh, attached cross bridges at any point in time, then as I said the force that is produced between the millipede and the stick depends on the number of attached cross bridges and the extension of the leg. So, if the leg is already fully extended it can produce a certain pulling force. If it is already fully flexed or contracted then it cannot produce any further force. So, it depends on the number of cross bridges at any point in time and it depends also on the extension of each of those legs or each of those cross bridges and it depends on a constant which uh, we can simply say is a spring constant. So, uh, at this fully flexed state it cannot produce any more force, 
but if you now pull this and it is attached and it is uh, extended there is like a spring it tends to pull it back. So, that is our spring constant k and therefore, simply integrating it for all possible values gives us the force at a certain velocity. Remember I said the experimental data that is used is for the production of force at a constant velocity of uh, movement or uh, uh, and this data uh, as you might have read in your uh, uh, classes is the so called force versus velocity uh, function that a lot of people had experimentally obtained in the early part of the 20th century. So, this is a summary of how muscles produce force and uh, as you can see also in the millipede model muscles can only produce tensile force and not contractile force. Now, how do we go about doing some calculations on this? Uh, I have al already mentioned uh, uh, your knowledge of the muscle force being a function of velocity. So, that, uh, so that we can write the force is a function of the length which is the uh, length versus tension force as I said the greater uh, at very large lengths capacity to produce force is not much at medium lengths it is good at short lengths it again it is not good. So, it is a function of uh, length it is a function of the rate of change of length and it is also a function of the amount of activity. So, this activity I need to uh, say a little bit more because it seems that I am bringing it in uh, suddenly. There are uh, many ways of looking at activity you can say it is the amount of calcium available inside a single cell the more calcium uh, that is available the more actin and myosin molecules will be able to attach to each other. Uh, uh, at, at the macroscopic level uh, you can say more calcium will be made available if the rate of activation or the rate of uh, electrical signals is high uh, compared to when the rate of uh, nerve signals is low. So, uh, this is our macroscopic uh, function to say the uh, force developed by muscle is a function of its length, it is a function of its speed and it is a function of the level of activity. So, the length dependence depends on the thick and thin filament overlap, the velocity dependence depends on the cross bridge, uh, cross bridge reaction rate, uh, it depends on the solution of the equations that I gave in the uh, previous uh, uh, screen. And uh, because these two are, are separate they are independent and separable therefore, I can write the force is a function of the uh, length and it is a function of activity multiplied by a function that depends only on the, only on the velocity. The reason I am uh, saying this is it is easy for us to think like this it is easy for us to say there is a component that depends on velocity and there is another component that depends on length and activity ok. So, we will group these uh, in this way and for our first level of solution we will say that when the velocity is nearly 0 that means it is not moving very fast. So, very fast is when I move extremely rapidly when I am doing most normal activity of lifting objects placing them uh, somewhere I am moving fairly slowly and therefore, I will say that the velocity is nearly 0 and the muscle is said to be isometric and the contribution of F 2 is constant ok. We never say it is uh, it is not there we do not we do not actually ignore it we say it is constant and therefore, we keep it uh, as a constant in the background. Now, this is a composite of functions that you have already seen uh, I will again I uh, will elaborate a little bit uh, more. So, this is a static curve where I have uh, drawn length here and this is force. So, this refers back to the curve that I showed uh, earlier uh, just just to remind you this is the curve that I showed earlier. So, this total muscle force is now represented simply as these two axes, but I am introducing another axis which is activity. So, the greater the activity the greater is the net force ok and the less the activity the more it becomes like passive muscle ok. As you increase the activity it becomes more and more act the active component becomes a large component of the force. If you reduce activity it becomes more and more like a passive muscle and if you uh, you have already seen the length versus force curve you it is also presented in physiology texts commonly. So, uh, it is worth looking at the force versus activity curve and I have drawn this here uh, sorry I have drawn here the length versus activity curve. This is important to uh, note uh, for our later discussions because when activity increases length decreases ok. Length is not uh, directly proportional it is uh, negatively proportional to uh, the activity because obviously it makes uh, sense if I increase the activity of my muscle my muscle length decreases and my 
uh, in this case uh, the flexion angle decreases. Uh, and this is important when we look at the uh, as a feedback control system. So let me show you a summary of all that we have discussed as a simulation. So here I have a cartoon of the muscle. So look at this. This is where what we'll talk about uh, mostly. Uh, and this is the, here we have our force length curve that I have already showed. And then I have some experiment controls. This is my uh, cartoon of the sarcomere showing a pair of uh, actin filaments on both sides of the sarcomere and a thick filament uh, in the middle with all these uh, myosin heads sticking out. So if I uh, let us think of an isometric activity and if I change length you can see that the overlap between the thick and thin filaments decreases. So here I have a very large length and therefore not all the potential uh, uh, myosin heads have an actin to which they can attach. And as I increase length even more, you can see that keeps on decreasing. And here I have a pair of uh, lines that show what point on this force length curve that corresponds to. So as I go to longer lengths, you can see the descending uh, force production capability. The red line goes to less and less in amplitude or less and less force that is being produced. Now, as I come to a length somewhere here, all the myosin heads have a potential partner, uh, have a potential actin to which they can attach. And therefore, in this region, you, we have the maximum force producing capacity. And as we go uh, look at these uh, uh, thin filaments, as we go to even shorter lengths, you can see now the, uh, the actin heads are now facing the opposite sides uh, myosin uh, head. So the, so the myosin and the actin are now also having some uh, uh, facing the opposite sides and therefore they are not contributing to this pulling force. Now imagine in the case of the millipede, if the sticks are so close that the stick of the left millipede is being faced by the uh, right millipede, then they are, uh, the uh, force production again is going to uh, compete with each other and therefore you have a decreasing capacity for force production. So uh, I hope you are also looking at the cartoon to show that uh, as I change length, so I am not activating the muscle as I change length, the muscle also stretches. So the muscle also stretches and let us go to an isotonic force case first. So here I have only the capacity to change the size of the uh, weight that I am attaching to the muscle. So I have a cartoon of the muscle and a cartoon of uh, 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 the force that is being applied which I am showing as a, as a weight because it is a weight and again in the static case if we ignore uh, uh, any uh, acceleration other than due to gravity, there is a fixed force on the muscle. If I change the force, uh, naturally the uh, length of the muscle changes. So this is just like having a rubber band to which you are adding uh, weight. So as I said, this behaves very much like a rubber band. Uh, now if I cause activity, how can I cause activity in the muscle? I will stimulate the muscle uh, either artificially or naturally producing electrical activity which will then cause this train of uh, events that is the uh, neuromuscular junction, the excitation contraction coupling, release of calcium and the interaction between myosin and actin. So let me stimulate uh, and let me stimulate initially at a very low rate. Can you see what is it doing? It is twitching. The muscle is twitching. Uh, so in the process of activity, you can see that the muscle is lifting it by a uh, lifting the weight by a small amount. And over here I have a graph showing the force produced by the muscle. The force produced by the muscle here is constant because it is simply equal to the force uh, presented by this uh, weight in the gravitational field. And these, uh, this green uh, trace is the electrical signals that are activating the muscle, the stimulus being uh, given to the muscle. And every time a stimulus is presented, the muscle pulls and then when the stimulus is no longer present, it again relaxes. So as I said, you may, you, know, you should imagine this entire train, uh, uh, train of activity 
the stimulation releases calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once the stimulation is gone, sarcoplasmic reticulum is taken back, uh, takes back the calcium uh, and so on. Now, if we increase the rate of stimulation, what happens? You can see the stimulation is coming so fast that the muscle does not have time to relax between the uh, stimulation uh, pulses and therefore, it now holds the weight up and it also holds it up at a, with a much greater uh, strength. Let me use the word loosely just now with a much greater strength than it was holding it earlier. So, let me uh, stop stimulation. I now stimulate what happens? Look at all uh, the pictures. What is happening here is clear enough, right? What is happening here also should make sense. Uh, I am also incorporating uh, fatigue uh, st uh, simulation. Let me remove fatigue so that I can explain it without bringing in fatigue. I stimulate. Why does this uh, go so far down? Because this is the force that uh, the muscle is producing now to balance the weight. Uh, uh, actually, I should, I do not have, uh, later on in the simulation, I will also change this cur curve. So, this curve you should see really as a force producing capacity of the muscle. So, I will not uh, dwell on this uh, very much uh, now. Later on, I will show you another simulation where I, where I, uh, this also changes uh, with multiple parameters. So, as uh, you can see, when I stimulate, it shortens because it now finds a new equilibrium point where at a shorter length, it produces uh, sufficient force to uh, balance the force produced by the weight. And uh, that depends, as I have uh, already discussed, it depends on the level of activity and it depends on the length. Okay? Uh, so, there are different experimental uh, conditions under which we can uh, study this muscle. Uh, they are called isometric, uh, isotonic, you can also have constant velocity. I am not bringing in constant velocity here because it is, uh, it is worth keeping the discussion uh, well contained. So, let us put in some functions. So, the passive tissue properties, I, uh, the passive tissue properties uh, of both the tendon, I have not said anything about the tendon uh, so far, but I will bring in the tendon slowly and the connective tissue in the muscle have the same exponential uh, shape because any, when you are talking about a real uh, joint uh, controlled by two muscles, you have muscle fibers that uh, have an elastic property, it can also actively produce force and you also have tendons. And the tendon should uh, have a certain property and I remember I said that the, uh, the passive property of the muscle itself uh, has an exponential shape uh, and uh, remembering that uh, uh, exponent of 0 is equal to uh, 1, I need to subtract of 1 because at uh, uh, 0 length the uh, tension due to any elastic uh, object is 0. But there are uh, other refinements uh, we can make to this uh, function, but basically this is the function we will use both for the tendon and for the passive muscle itself. Uh, so, the variable here is the length of the uh, muscle if you are talking about the muscle fiber of the tendon if you are talking about the tendon. So, this function we will uh, use uh, in our calculations of uh, behavior of the muscle. The active uh, force length property, uh, we have described it uh, as a phenomenon, it depends on the overlap between the uh, thick and thin filaments and we can describe it empirically by a parabolic function because it looks like a parabola. It, uh, we can describe it by a parabola and the variable here again is uh, our length. So, the, uh, the force that is due to activity due to the uh, active co combination of actin and myosin as a function of length is described by this and this is true only for positive values of the activity because uh, a parabola in uh, as a mathematical entity uh, extends up to infinity uh, negative and positive values of uh, length but the, but uh, it is only this is only true for positive values of the activity the peak force of this parabola is the so called neural input which we will uh, uh, remember is the alpha motor neuron firing rate uh, which i also showed in the simulation the rate of firing de uh, determines the uh, level of activity and uh, that is what determines the peak force. And uh, these two in combination 
is what we have talked about so far that the force production depends on the level of activity, it depends on the length. The total force is the combination of the active force and the passive force. So, these two equations we have already uh, seen. Now, we bring in the control of muscle. Uh, it's, uh, why do we need to have uh, feedback control? Because uh, uh, I have in the simulation of muscle also a component of fatigue. Uh, and fatigue is familiar to all of us. Uh, the longer you use your muscle uh, without rest, the greater will be its fatigue. What does fatigue mean? Its capacity to uh, generate force will keep on decreasing until you uh, are completely unable to do any physical work because your muscles are fatigued. Now, what does that mean? Your brain tells your muscle, I want to lift this cup of coffee, right? Uh, and uh, your brain should know whether your muscle is doing the required task or not and therefore, it should have some feedback as to the state of the muscle and therefore, if you have feedback about the force of the muscle and that does not agree with the force that your brain has commanded it, then you, your brain will correct for that error and say, I will give a greater command and uh, you correct that error by producing a greater force so that we achieve the desired force. So, this is how feedback control systems work. And you know feedback control systems uh, uh, to state it formally will be able to compensate for changes in the properties of the plant being controlled, the system being controlled. It can also compensate for any external perturbation. So, for example, if I am now filling the coffee uh, from a uh, coffee dispenser, the weight is changing continuously and I can do it even with my eyes closed uh, or even and also even with my ears closed because my muscle feels that the weight is continuously changing, sends that information back to the nervous system. A lot of the correction is done at the spinal cord level. So, it is a simple feedback uh, control system uh, at the spinal cord level that does not require you to think and say, now uh, the load is 15 grams greater, produce a little bit more, more force. You do, you do no thinking about it. Uh, but for, of course, for lower animals, that is the full extent of their thinking. Uh, uh, but for uh, uh, animals with complicated central nervous systems, uh, that happens at the literally at the subconscious level. So, here I have a diagram of uh, in cartoon form of the anatomy. So, we have a muscle here and there are four sensors that are called Golgi tendon organs and they sense they are uh, uh, in the tendons as the name suggests and the force on the muscle being in line with the force uh, on the tendon uh, is sensed by the Golgi tendon organs and it goes back through an afferent nerve called the primary B afferent and this carries information by, uh, through uh, an interneuron back to the alpha motor neuron. So, this is the alpha motor neuron. The alpha motor neuron is in the uh, spinal cord. It carries information saying that the force uh, is so much uh, more than what you want or uh, less than what you want or equal to what you want. And then there are these uh, sensors inside the muscle itself, they are called intrafusal fibers. They contain uh, length sensors in series with a uh, muscle fiber that is capable of contracting. So, why is it in series? We will uh, see that uh, presently. So, these length sensors will tell you whenever there is a change in the length. Uh, change in the length of the sensor. So, the sensor actually senses a change in the uh, length of itself. Uh, the way it is attached is the sensors are attached to as I said these muscle fibers that are capable of contracting. If the and those are called the intrafusal fibers. The normal muscle fibers uh, whose job is only to produce force are called extrafusal fibers. These intrafusal fibers that are capable of contracting if they are very slack then when the length, uh, then when the overall muscle stretches or shortens because the uh, length sensor is now being left slack, it will not sense the change in length very much. But if the intrafusal fibers are contracted and they are pulling on this length sensor, then when the muscle itself changes, the length sensor responds very uh, promptly or uh, sensitively to the change in length of the muscle. And therefore, the activity of these intrafusal fibers is like a sensitivity changer for the uh, length sensor in the muscle and the length sensors are the spindle receptors in the muscle. And the spindle receptors take back this information 
about the length of the muscle through what are called the primary A afferents. Uh, this is one A afferent in contrast to the four sensors which are carried back by the one B uh, afferents. And these also go back uh, to the alpha motor ne neuron and that forms the uh, two, uh, two feedback path feedback control of the muscle. The sensitivity of the uh, length sensors is adjusted by the activity of the intrafusal fibers which comes via what is called the gamma motor neuron. So, this is the gamma motor neuron which comes from the brain. Now, if the gamma motor neuron activity is high then the length sensors are very active. So, it is uh, there is evidence to say that when muscles are contracting in a uh, in a way that is uh, out of the voluntary intention of the uh, uh, of the person uh, or what is called spasticity then it is uh, often because the uh, gamma activity is very much higher than normal it is uh, pathologically high and therefore these length sensors uh, are hypersensitive to change in length the length sensors go back and any change in uh, so let me talk about the force sensors first the force sensors uh, if you are producing more force than you want you reduce activity if you are producing less force than you want you increase activity so the force sensors are part of what is a simple uh, negative feedback control system and as you know from your control systems theory for as a, uh, any system to be controllable you will want only negative feedback you have positive feedback for it to perform other functions like oscillation uh, and, and so on. Uh, very often in physiology the term positive feedback uh, is, uh, is used uh, incorrectly to mean feed forward. Okay? Uh, but for a feedback uh, control system you only want negative feedback. In the case of the spindle receptors it actually causes an increase in activity where, when there is an increase in spindle receptor activity. So, an increase in primary A uh, afferent activity causes an increase in the activity of the alpha motor neuron. So, that at first sight looks like a positive feedback system, but it cannot be. But remember, the I already gave you that graph showing uh, the activity versus length, and the relationship is actually negative. Uh, and again, I uh, gave this very simple example if I increase activity, my muscle length decreases, if I decrease activity, my muscle length increases. So, there we have a negative proportionality and therefore, the length feedback or the spindle receptor feedback is also a negative feedback system. So, uh, the physiology of uh, the reflex system agrees with our uh, engineering knowledge of negative feedback systems. Uh, and there are lots of interesting things that uh, you can think about uh, when you uh, think of negative feedback systems. You know that under certain conditions uh, they can become unstable and instability is manifest as uh, oscillations uh, uh, and uh, some kinds of tremors in the nervous system are also believed to be because of uh, feedback control uh, instability. Okay. Now, uh, I just want to uh, put uh, some of uh, these things formally. In the case of the spindle uh, sensor, I have already mentioned these two, it depends on the gamma input that is it, it depends on the sensitivity that is determined by the contraction of the intrafusal fibers. It also depends on the fiber length. Experimentally, it is also seen that it depends on the rate of change of length and these are all additive. As I said, the contraction of the intrafusal fibers increases the sensitivity of the uh, spindle receptors and therefore, it adds on. Uh, so, the firing of the uh, primary A afferents depends on the activity of the gamma fibers. It depends on the length, it depends on the rate of change of length. Why do you think uh, we need to have a rate of change of length from a verbal description point of view? When you have a sudden change in length, you want the nervous system to be able to respond to that quickly. Uh, from an engineering point of view, what we have here is a derivative feedback and uh, which means uh, which actually means the same thing as uh, the ability to respond to a sudden change in length. So, uh, we have a proportional these two are the proportional components and we have a derivative component. A proportional derivative controller will give you very good transient response. Okay? Uh, 
the as you know from your control system theory, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the first level uh, comprehensive control uh, is achieved in a linear system by using what is called proportional integral and derivative control. The integral control is not put into our equations. Uh, there are other ways by which integral control is uh, achieved. Uh, uh, in the case of integral control, you do not need to have very fast response. So, you can have integration even at higher levels where the response can be on the order of seconds because uh, what is the uh, need for the integral component of a PID control system? The integral reduces your steady state error. So, in the, uh, so that matters only in the long run. That means over, a, over several seconds. Your uh, proportion make sure your system uh, works uh, effectively as a feedback control system. The derivative control makes uh, your system respond well to uh, transients or to sudden changes. So, and this data is available from a lot of physiological experimental work uh, and therefore it is uh, all right for us to put this into our uh, equation. In the case of the Golgi uh, tendon organ feedback, we do not have a lot of experimental uh, data or therefore, although it is tempting to add a, uh, a derivative control and say that there ought to be a derivative control. Since there is no evidence, I think the simplest is to say that there is at least a proportional control. We know that there is at least a proportional control. So, the equation that I have used is uh, simply that there is proportional control. Now, the firing of the alpha motor neuron for each muscle depends on its input from the brain, its feedback sense, uh, signals from the uh, spindle receptors and the Golgi tendon organ and a third component that I have not mentioned so far, but uh, from your physiology uh, uh, studies, you might know that every pair of mu muscles interact with each other at a very low level. That means, only at the spinal level and that is what is called reciprocal inhibition and uh, I will not go into this uh, in great detail except to say that when I am trying to bend my elbow uh, by flexing uh, my muscle, my flexor muscle, activating my flexor muscle. Uh, then I do not want my extensor to be fighting with it, I do not want it to be competing with it and therefore, when I flex my muscle, I want to cause an, a corresponding decrease in the activity of my flexors and this is particularly important when I want to do fast movement. So, if I want to quickly move my flexor, then instead of simply giving separate signals to the flexor and uh, extensor, as soon as there is an ex, uh, a, a signal to the flexor, that signal goes back to the extensor and say immediately now you should relax, you, uh, you should have a certain amount of relaxation. So, that is the reciprocal inhibition and therefore, our equation for our alpha motor neuron depends on the activity command from the brain, it depends on the signal from the primary A afferent uh, or the uh, spindle receptor feedback, it depends negatively on the feedback from the Golgi tendon organ. So, this is really our uh, uh, negative feedback uh, of the Golgi tendon uh, uh, feedback. The spindle receptor feedback as I said in our internal relationship it is actually uh, it gives you a, a sign change and finally, there is also an inhibition due to the op, uh, signal from the opposite muscle or the reciprocal inhibition. So, this is the pair of equations that describes a pair of muscles that are working together to activate a joint to produce flexion or extension of the joint. Uh, control system for a single muscle, this is uh, simply a block representation of the uh, cartoon uh, of the anatomy that I showed earlier. So, we have the muscle, we have the alpha motor neuron which is actually the controller as well as the summing block. So, this I should say is a controller. and summing block. And the muscle's output is only force that acts on the load and we have a change in length. So, which also you have seen in the simulation depending on the load and depending on the activity, uh, the force interacts with the load to produce a change in length. Uh, yeah. So, all these are uh, described simply by the equations that we have seen so far. So, the force is fed back through the Golgi tendon organs and we have a simple negative feedback system and here this force to length conversion is where we have a change of sign which also we have seen and this change of sign uh, 
uh, goes back as feedback and therefore this is also a negative feedback uh, pathway. And then we have an adjustment of the sensitivity from the brain that is our gamma motor neuron that uh, controls the sensitivity of the spindle receptors. So now we go on to the mechanics and then we will put both the muscles together. In the case uh, of a single joint, I have drawn a, a cartoon. In the case of the elbow joint, the muscles, the way the muscle attaches is it comes down here and attaches uh, here. But the mechanics can be described correctly by what I have shown here. Let me get rid of this. So we have two muscles. One muscle is a flexor, it change, uh, reduces this angle and the other the uh, muscle on the left is the extensor uh, so muscle 1 is an extensor muscle 2 is a flexor and they have a certain point at which they attach to the skeleton and the mechanical advantage due to this uh, lever system uh, the force is diminished by a factor x2 divided by xw in the case of the flexor and x1 divided by xw in the case of the extensor and the length or the uh, arc of movement is increased by a factor xw divided by x2 or xw divided by x1 in the case of the flexor and the extensor. I will not uh, go into the calculations in detail because that is reasonably straightforward uh, uh, static mechanics, but I will put in these two equations to say that the moment due to muscle 1 in the clockwise direction in this uh, diagram, so this is the clockwise direction, is the muscle force multiplied by x1 multiplied by uh, the sine of this angle phi1. And similarly, we have a counterclockwise moment m2 which is the force produced by muscle 2 multiplied by this distance x2 multiplied by uh, the sine of the angle. And there is one more component. So, if I have an external force and I am pushed down on the uh, on my hand uh, in the example of the elbow joint. So, this is an external force W. So, this is an additional component. So, this W can be either downwards in this diagram or it can be upwards. And if it is downwards, it will uh, add to the clockwise moment, if it is upwards it will contribute to the counterclockwise moment and we should add that appropriately. So, we can uh, uh, add that and the, the position of the joint at any given point in time will be when m1 is equal to m2. Obviously, that is be a static equilibrium uh, condition. Okay. Uh, now, I will just complete uh, the control, the neuromuscular control of this and then I will show you uh, how we can simulate all of this uh, by solving these equations numerically uh, and that will be the conclusion of this lecture. The, so, here I have simply added the uh, reciprocal inhibition. So, this is the reciprocal inhibition here from the uh, from this muscle uh, from muscle 2 so spindle receptors to the alpha motor neuron of muscle 1 and similarly uh, a reciprocal inhibition from muscle 1's spindle receptors to the alpha motor neuron of muscle 2. Everything else is the same as that of a single muscle. Both of them act and produce a torque at the joint and that changes the angle of the joint. So, uh, how do we solve the equations? The counterclockwise and counterclockwise moments uh, we calculate for all possible uh, positions and uh, when uh, we solve the equation when the counterclockwise moment equals the, counter, uh, the clockwise moment. Uh, and the joint angle at which the moments balance is a solution uh, for the problem and we can calculate the solution continuously in time. So, let me again show you a simulation. Okay. So, this is a somewhat busy slide. Let me start with very little activity. Uh, so, here I have a cartoon putting together everything that I have uh, discussed so far. We have two muscles, a flexor and uh, an extensor and we have the input from the alpha motor neuron that comes to the flexor, input from the alpha motor, uh, corresponding alpha motor neuron of the extensor coming to the extensor and we have feedback of the length from the spindle receptors. We have control of the sensitivity of the intrafusal fibers by the gamma uh, motor neuron which comes from the brain. And we have 
the feedback from the Golgi tendon organs going back and the Golgi tendon organ uh, signal goes via an interneuron uh, that is shown here and all this is summed by the alpha motor neuron and the output of the alpha motor neuron also we have expressed uh, algebraically and that will let us calculate the, uh, the force of the muscle for a given input from the brain, the length of the muscle, the uh, uh, tension in the muscle uh, and so on. And here the muscle properties as we have uh, been discussing uh, have a length dependence and they also have an activity dependence, they also have a velocity dependence. The velocity dependence is there in the, in the background, there is also uh, inertia of the, uh, of the moving uh, segment of the, uh, of the skeletal system here. So, let me change the activity of the flexor, sorry the extensor, I have just changed the uh, activity of the extensor and now I change the activity of the flexor. You can see when this activity changes, uh, the cartoon uh, joint now moves towards flexion or moves towards extension. And now here I have a sequence of pulses that represent inputs from the brain to the alpha motor neuron of the extensor, uh, inputs from the brain to the alpha motor neuron of the flexor and I show the resulting neural signals from the extensor's primary A afferent which is from the spindle receptors and the flexor's primary A afferent which is from the spindle receptor of the flexor and the extensor's primary B, spindle, uh, Golgi tendon organs of the extensor and uh, primary B of the flexor, Golgi tendon organs of the flexor and the resulting activity is the firing of the uh, alpha motor neuron. So, I can represent the firing like this as signals that are going as action potentials from the alpha motor neuron down to the flexor. So, here I have more activity in the flexor and that is represented by more nerve impulses per unit time in the flexors and fewer nerve impulses from in unit time from the extensors. More flexion, so if I move it quickly you can see this is what happens. I can flex, I can extend by changing the activity of the flexor, I can also extend and flex by changing the activity of the extensor and in between you can see that the firing rate of the extensor afferents and the flexor afferents also change. So, the calculation that I have described uh, algebraically are implemented and to be able to convey this information uh, not just to engineers, uh, but also to physiologists uh, and physicians. The information of the neural activity is presented in the form of nerve firings which is something that is seen in an experimental physiologist's uh, laboratory uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the uh, one purpose of the simulation is to say that we can produce activity that is similar to the, the, uh, the phenomena that is being observed and in a form that is recognizable to an experimentalist. So, here I have uh, two curves, a green and blue curve. The, uh, the blue curve represents uh, clockwise moment, the clockwise moment is from the extensor, the green curve represents the counterclockwise moment uh, which is from the flexor. And I will show you if I increase flexor activity, the green curve alone changes. And the solution of the equation as I described is the intersection. So, the intersection between the green and blue moments is the solution of, the, uh, of this. Okay. So, sometimes it searches for solutions uh, depending on the speed of the computer. Uh, so, this is the solution uh, where the counterclockwise and the clockwise moments balance and that gives us the instantaneous joint activity. So, to a certain extent uh, the simulation is realistic, I will make the two muscles co-contract to give you a simple demonstration of what might happen uh, in an experimental condition. So, if I have very low activity of the two muscles and then if I increase load in both directions you can see that it flexes very easily. If I increase both the flexor and the extensor activity because they are being increased simultaneously 
you do not see any change in the angle when I am only increasing flexor and uh, extensor activity. But if I change the load, you see that it does not respond as much as it did before because what has happened is the joint has simply become very stiff and this is what happens in the case of spasticity. I have various uh, control bars to say that I can change the sensitivity of the, uh, the spindle receptors in the uh, synapse of the spindle receptor to the uh, alpha motor neuron, the sensitivity of the Golgi tendon, the alpha motor neuron to the Golgi tendon organ and the reciprocal inhibition uh, synapse and so on. There is also the gamma base firing which is what is believed to be affected during uh, certain kinds of spasticity that can also be changed. Then there is what is called alpha gamma coactivation. The sensitivity of the spindle receptors is increased uh, proportional to the activity of the muscle itself and that is what is referred to in the neurophysiology literature as alpha gamma coactivation. That can also be changed but are the values that I have assumed uh, uh, are not very realistic because there is not a lot of experimental data. But from an understanding point of view, it is important to be able to say that we can write the uh, equations from an engineering uh, uh, point of view to describe it because uh, equations after all describe uh, phenomena in a very compact uh, form. Okay. Uh, and uh, what I had promised to show you earlier is look at these uh, curves. When I increase and decrease activity, you will see that the curve changes amplitude. So, the active mu uh, muscle force changes and here also I have drawn uh, the equilibrium point which is actually calculated from these curves and I have uh, drawn the point at which the equilibrium uh, length of the extensor, these are all extensors uh, and uh, the flexors uh, can be calculated in the background. And the force of the extensor tendon is equal to the force of the muscle fiber uh, extensor and similarly the force on the flexor tendon is equal to the force of the flexor muscle fibers. Uh, so, uh, all these uh, curves tell us how the calculations are being done in the background. Okay. So, now an interesting thing is what is observed uh, uh, as phenomena is when you test the muscle and the subject voluntarily or involuntarily changes the stiffness of the muscle. We can actually implement this model uh, physically and uh, that would be a haptics uh, simulation of the neuromuscular system. And uh, just to tell you, I am not going to do a demonstration now because I do not have the apparatus. I can connect uh, a physical system that contains a motor and force sensors that uh, will simulate the neurophysiology of a single joint system. The motor will control the position, uh, the sensors will uh, sense the uh, force and all you are doing is, do, uh, is putting out a change in the stiffness of the system depending on the neurophysiological status uh, that is calculated numerically. So, we can make a physical device that simply controls stiffness. Uh, and we can uh, it measures the applied force, controls the motor position uh, with the neurophysiology being completely numerically calculated inside the computer. Uh, the computer computational model as I have shown includes the muscle properties, includes the sensors, the muscle spindles and the Golgi tendon organs, includes the known neural, uh, neural circuits. Uh, the, well, there are higher level neural circuits also that involve motor programs uh, and so on. All that we have not discussed, only at the low level this is what we can describe and we can put some formal descriptions to them. Okay. Uh, so, now what is the use of this uh, in a, uh, so when we make a model we are actually overfitting the model because in the case of human beings all that we are getting is the stiffness of the joint in any kind of measurement. And internally from other pieces of evidence we say that there is a certain strength or weakness in the muscle, there is a certain level of activity of the gamma uh, motor neuron and so on. But we can simulate such a system, we can also simulate that of a normal human being who can apply uh, therapy to uh, uh, a subject uh, with some pathology that is either spasticity or, uh, or uh, muscle weakness for example. So, uh, a device that can provide strengthening exercise, a device that can provide lengthening exercise, all that can be, uh, can be built based on our model of the uh, neuromuscular control system. 
Uh, now, all these are possible we can make electromechanical pneumatic devices in robotics based on our understanding of the neuromuscular system. We can make artificial systems that behave uh, as similar to the known neuromuscular system. We can uh, make artificial uh, systems that uh, interact with the known neuromuscular system and so on. These are all applications uh, uh, if you want to think about it. So, I will summarize to say that I have made uh, presented to you a formal mathematical model of the neuromuscular movement and I have shown that simulating this uh, gives us uh, uh, a fairly useful uh, simulation of uh, control of a joint by the neuromuscular system and I have said that it is possible to make a simple neuromuscular haptic system because all you are controlling is, is stiffness uh, at the macroscopic level and haptics really is the complement of a robotic system. And uh, a lot of therapy is just that. Uh, a patient is weak, a therapist comes and teaches that patient how to compensate for that weakness. And the goal of therapy is to hand over control more and more to the patient that is being treated. And that handing over is the interaction between the therapist and the uh, subject. So, haptics, uh, which is a simulation of the uh, subject or the patient, is a complement of robotics, which is the therapist. And therefore, we can think of uh, robotics in neurorehabilitation neuro using such models. Okay, thank you.